Well, I've been talking um, for some time on Muslim theology. Um, probably I've done no more than bewilder you and convince you that this is as intricate and hard to understand as, um, as other theologies. It is a brilliant and a very diverse tradition of thought. Um, what I want to do for the rest of this lecture is to follow this cue um, of Ghazali's and turn to the third core aspect of the totality of the religion of Islam, the level of ihsan. Now, before I do this, I think I should repeat the disclaimer that I issued at, at the beginning of my lectures, namely that a formal presentation like this can't encapsulate the reality of the spiritual life. And there's a quote here again from Ghazali, who expresses this point. Such ideas, i.e. transcendent mystical ideas, are like virgins, and the hand of words cannot reach the edge of their veil. Even though our task is to marry the virgin ideas to the men of words in the bedchambers of speech, yet verbal expressions cannot but be allusions to misleadingly different ideas. But having uttered that, that caveat, I'm going to venture at, le venture at least some superficial judgments about the nature of the spiritual life in Islam, in as much as we, we can speak about it. Again, as I did with theology, I'd like to go back to the beginning and the archetype. <coughs> What's the foundation of all discourse about Ihsan, about the spiritual life of Muslims? Well, obviously, it's revelation itself. Heaven is too high for human beings to, to be able to build and lift up a stairway to it. We need God to lower a stair from above, and it's then our responsibility to climb it. So the basic obligation and purpose of religion is to find and to understand and ultimately to climb that stairway that leads upwards. In fact, it's not just the basic obli obligation of religion, it can be seen as the reason for our very creation. In Islam's understanding, God, being perfect, wishes his perfection to be known. His perfection, in this view, is only complete when it is witnessed. Um, classical image is the peacock's tail must be unfurled. Hence the inevitability of manifestation, this apparently impossible paradox of why anything other than good, good should exist. So Islam sees the spiritual life as a kind of natural, innate human response to the very fact of our existence, confronted constantly, however much we may distract ourselves from, from, from the fact constantly confronting what Heidegger called our throneness, the mere inexplicable fact of our existence as, as self-conscious souls in this extraordinary world. So we find a volition within God to create the world, a necessary volition, not quite the near platonic idea of the inevitable constant emanation of the world as part of the divine perception. It's, it's very much in the Semitic tradition of God creating in time. So this, this volition within God to bring the world into being is seen by the Muslim thinkers as a necessary unfolding or manifestation of the divine perfection. And as I mentioned in my previous lecture, it's specifically that aspect of perfection which the Quran calls the divine compassion. Remember I said that in a certain perspective, God looks out upon all of the latent, uncreated beings and in his infinite compassion has pity on them because they have, they're still in the imperfection of non-existence. So he breathes upon them and, and bestows upon them the blessing of existence. Again, this, this feminine idea of rahma, of the, the divine compassion, the divine engendering of the world. Um, so this is essentially why the world exists. It is the, the simple manifestation of the divine volition to be known in the register of the divine love and compassion. It's, the world is the solidification in this view of divine love. 